Hey, okay, so you can hear me. Everyone can hear me back there, we're good? Okay. Well, hey, nice to uh, have you all come out here. Thank you for coming to this. It looks like we got a really big crowd. Sorry, I can't see you guys over here. I gotta look under the screens, but I'm here. Um, so yeah, um, I do a lot of coaching, a lot of real racing, been iRacing for, it's crazy to think that it's been almost 10 years on iRacing. And uh, the sim has improved a lot, massively, especially last in the, just in the last two years. Um, I do a lot more coaching with real drivers at all levels, um, and of course sim racers too. So I'm coaching drivers from club level, uh, Spec Miata, Formula Ford, all the way to IndyCar. IndyCar drivers are now practicing on the sim, and it's not only just uh, you know, to learn the tracks, it's also because the cars are so much better than they used to be. So it's a really good training tool, and there's just so much you can learn uh, from the sim, so it's great. It's a really good time to be into it, and it's a really good time to upgrade your hardware too. So as you can see, you got all this Good equipment coming out, and even this rig that I'm sitting in uh, right now is pretty spectacular. You know, you got the, the uh, traction loss on this, and uh, CST pedals. This is an 80-20 rig, too, which actually I recently upgraded to. Um, I used to have an Obutto, and then I, I kind of got tired of not being able to get the seating position just right, so I did go 80-20. Um, actually, a, a guy out of Frisco, 4Play Racing, he makes those rigs, so... I got one of those, and um, that made a big difference, too, in my driving, just getting the seating position right. That's really important. Um, it's going to be dependent on your size and kind of what you feel comfortable with, but uh, the seating position is really critical because if you... you you got to have good leverage on the steering wheel to be able to make quick corrections. Um, you don't want to have the wheel too far away from you. If, you have the, if you're having to stretch your arms to reach the wheel, you think about how much more distance that is to cover. You know, when you're turning the wheel and say when something happens on the screen, you see it, you react to it, and it's going to be a little bit more delayed. So you're going to be a bit behind the car um, already, you know, even just with uh, having to reach so far to the wheel. So if you, if you get the wheel um, pretty close to you, you want to have your arms bent at maybe about a 90 degree angle is pretty good, something like this. The, one, the rig that I'm sitting in right now is actually the placement of the wheel is okay. It might be a little bit close. But it's too high for me because it's, uh, I have a short torso, so I like the wheel a little bit lower. You pretty much want the top of the wheel to be level with uh, like the bottom of your chin. That's a good reference for the wheel. So top of the wheel to the bottom of your chin, and then your arms bent at about 90 degrees is pretty good. And then with the pedals, too, um, you got so many nice high-end sets of pedals now, which is really, really cool. I mean, it's, it really is a game changer on iRacing. Uh, not only does it make it a lot more fun and realistic, you just feel more in control of the car. So the, the precise pedal inputs are really important. And um, if you can, you want to try to get your pedals elevated a little bit. So you, you kind of can think about it like, um, you know, where, where is the heel of your foot in relation to where you're sitting, you know, where, where your butt's at? And you want to try to get the, the heel of your feet maybe within like a couple inches of where, where you're sitting. Um, and what that does is that'll give you better leverage for the pedals as well. So you can, you can push them harder, and it's actually easier, much easier on your lower back uh, to have the pedals a little bit more level. And uh, uh, you, can, you can control them better, too. So now I've got the Hoosing Field pedals at home, and I uh, highly recommend those. That was a really good upgrade. My last set of pedals was a G27 Perfect Pedal, um, which I used for maybe about six years. So that was really good, too. But really nice upgrade. And recently, I just upgraded the triple monitors, too. I'd only had one screen for a pretty long time. Okay, so back to the class. Um, so this is going to be about road racing and uh, kind of more of an introductory thing, but just getting into the basics of what it takes to be fast on a road course and the mindset you want to have going into learning a track, learning a car, um, improving 
uh, qualifying pace, race pace, and also you know, getting acclimated with the dynamic weather on iRacing, which is a big thing now. Um, and that really changes your whole approach to practice. So when it comes to improving, you know, I talk to a lot of people. I mean, I coach a lot of people. Um, and I've, I learn something from everyone, which is part of why I love it. There's always something to learn from other people. Uh, everyone's got their own perspective on you know, their driving, their awareness, what they're doing, how to go fast, uh, and their own individual techniques. It's really fascinating. Now, with that said, you know, some people are kind of thinking that, okay, there's no way I can improve. This is as good as I can get. Um, I've tried and tried and tried over again, but you know, I just get the same results. I just cannot go any faster. And when that happens, um, that's when it's just you just need a change of perspective, uh, a new approach to your own driving, um, and what you're thinking about. It's really, it's really um, pretty complex driving fast. But uh, the reason I started teaching people is because I know that everyone can improve, and everyone's got their own potential. You know, no one's, not everyone is going to be like world championship level, and that's okay. But you can always improve, and you can still you know, reach your potential, which is why, that's why I enjoy driving. Competitive, always want to learn more, always want to improve. So if you have that mindset going in to learning, then, then you will improve. You'll improve uh, in all aspects of, of road racing. Now, road racing is different than oval racing, of course, um, a little bit different approach to it. A lot of things are similar, but, you know, road racing, you're, you're really driving against the track more so because there's just so much more stuff going on uh, on a road course. And you know, you've got so many more things to remember and replicate lap after lap. The way I look at it, um, doing a consistent lap, it's kind of like uh, playing a song. And you, know, you want to be able to play that song the exact same way every single lap. You want to be just you know, inch perfect with your inputs, the same way you're just hitting those chords perfect you know, on, on the instrument you're playing. It's the same thing, same approach. Uh, and a lot of that comes down to memory and how you're remembering what's happening. And there's a lot of information to take in. Um, it's really the difference between probably the fastest guys and average guys. Um, you know, when, when you're going around on track, I mean, there's a lot of stuff to take in when you're going at speed, when you're going fast. You're looking at reference points. You're looking at all of this stuff. And, and then you add in other cars. And when you're racing other cars, and most people, it's, it's overwhelming. But you can work to increase your awareness. And uh, that's actually what I do when I'm, when I'm coaching people. So it's, it's all about increasing your awareness to what the car is doing. Now, with that said, um, I'll first get into kind of learning a track and like how I would approach it. Um, say I was running on a new track. So the first thing I usually do is I will get a track map and I'll just kind of study it, look at it, get an idea of the general layout of the track. You know, you're not going to learn so much from a track map other than which way the corners go, the type of corners, you can get an idea and start to kind of get that visual memory of the track itself. So we're going to be at Donington uh, in the Renault for this session. I figure that's a good track because it's, I actually hate it, but it's got a lot of blind corners and a lot of hairpins and chicanes and really difficult stuff. It's really hard to be consistent here. It's, it's not very flowy, I guess. Well, at least the last sector right here is kind of Kind of unfun. <laughs> but, uh, so anyway, so we got the track layout here. And you can see, OK, let's pretend we've never done a lap on Doddington. So uh, you know, you've got the lower speed corner here. You can, see this, you can tell this is going to be faster flowing stuff. Fast, fast, fast. OK, so sector one and two is mostly fast corners. And the last sector is really tight. Uh, you got the chicane. You got the two hairpins. So what you could do when you're starting to uh, look at the track map, just you know, close your eyes and really try to start to visualize it in your head, the layout of the track. So say, for instance, I'm not looking at the track and I'm closing my eyes. OK, turn one, it's going to be a tight corner. It's going to open up. I'm going to get to throttle early because the corner opens up. So I can come off the corner faster. OK, turn two and three, sweeping fast, sweeping right and sweeping left, slightly harder breaking right into a straightaway, and then a left and a right. So you want to be able to start to visualize that in your head. Because it's all about getting that visual down. And that's going to give you that foundation for uh, uh, starting to learn the track. OK, so studying a track map, 
Um, and yeah, I mean, this is before you start to lap consistently, you've, you've, you've got to know the track, you've got to know the corners. You're not going to be fast if you aren't familiar with the track. If you're making mistakes, and there's all kinds of different ways to make mistakes, you, you want to know why you're making that mistake. But say, for instance, you're just going into a track and you think you're going into a left turn, but it's actually a right, or it's a hairpin, or you think it's a sweeper, but it's actually a hairpin, you go flying off track. Okay, you simply just don't have the track in your memory yet. So you need to put more of your focus first on just learning the track and getting the layout down. So once you've looked at the track map, um, a good, really good thing to do is just, just take slow laps on the track. In a car that you know, you know you're not trying to fight the car because you're, you're only trying to focus on learning the track. So just a slow lap, you know, maybe third or fourth gear, just kind of cruising around, kind of starting to build your awareness to the flow of the circuit, the types of corners. Okay, turn two, you know, easy flat out. This is all flat, full speed. So the next corner I really got to think about is this, I don't know what this corner is, four or five. But it's really fast and sweeping, and it opens up. Okay, so you can tell, you, you know, you're going to be able to carry a lot of speed through here left-hander here, so this is going to be flat out, full speed. Now I'm banking all this in my memory, which I'm not going to do right away, but that's why you, you, know, you might want to take a bunch of laps and do it and figure it out. Okay, this one, blind entry, um, apex is pretty late in the corner. It's pretty technical. It's a really technical track. And this one, again, blind apex, so um, you can't see the apex until you've already have, had to have committed to turn it to it. So, you know, that's just another thing to keep in mind. Okay, blind apex there. Okay, now we're going into the tight section of the track. Okay, so this is a chicane. Now on paper, it looked like a pretty tight chicane. Okay, now when I'm driving it, I realize it's actually, you can go pretty fast through there, potentially, but it's going to be tricky. So now we're going into the uh, hairpin. So this is, I know on the, the track map it looked really slow, but now we can really see how slow this corner is. Okay. Really slow corner. Okay, last corner on the circuit. Again, turning point's actually blind. So not only is this a really tight corner, I think it's the tightest corner on the track, or just like the previous one, but the turn in is blind, so when you're braking, you have to know where to turn in. And I'll get into that in a second, how to approach those types of corners. So, that, so that's kind of what I do when I'm starting to learn a track. I don't even really usually go fast. I just want to try to get that visual started, get that foundation built. So when I start doing laps, go faster and faster, I know where to go, because that's really important first. Um, right, so also why you want to do the um, laps at a slow speed is because on the track map, you can't, of course, tell the elevation. Uh, you can't tell the elevation changes in the track. And a lot of the times, that's going to play a big part in how you take a certain corner. Um, for instance, the last corner here, which I'll drive to. So it's really important to, to take into account elevation and try to, you know, read certain points of the track where, okay, there's camber here, this is off camber. Um, you know, an off camber corner, the car's going to feel different than a corner with grip. Because sometimes I see people driving and going into a certain corner um, too slow and it's off camber and they're braking too deep into the corner and then all of a sudden you gain grip at the apex and you're still braking and uh, you get snap over steer. People wonder why. A good example of that is uh, if anyone knows the spa circuit, um, the corner with no name I think it is, the left hander. When you start braking for that corner, there's no grip. It's downhill. The car's almost falling off the road. When you start to turn in, all of a sudden there's camber at the apex, so it gains grip. So that's something you need to keep in mind. Um, it's just an example. The, the initial braking, not a lot of grip, and then all of a sudden, when you start turning in, you better get off that brake. Because if you're braking and turning, when you, the car gains grip all of a sudden, you're gonna snap over steer every time. And so when I see people spin there, and people spin there all the time, it's, it's an easy corner to spin at. But you just got to think about that kind of stuff and think ahead. So start to expand your awareness to things like that in the track. It's really important. Little nuances in the track. So this last corner here, um, again, you can't see anything. Like, it's like you're 
breaking into the abyss. You don't know where the corner is or if it's going to still be there or what. So you want to have a point for uh, breaking and turning in these types of corners. Um, any kind of blind apex, you need to have a spot where you turn in. It's not so much um, you know, looking at the apex and then turning in at that point, because you can't see the apex until it's too late. If you waited to see the apex, then you would go off track every time, or you'd run way wide and you'd lose a lot of time. So you've got to have a turn-in spot for a blind apex. Anytime you can't see the apex, you better have a point where you're going to turn in. So that kind of adds something else to it. Um, you know, every corner you need to have a breaking point, um, an apex point, and a track out point. And so with a blind corner, you need to have a breaking point and a turn in point. And then, of course, you know where your apex is, but you've got to start turning into it before you see it. So, for example, in this last corner here, And sometimes your breaking points are going to be really hard to see. I mean, that, you know, you don't have any good references here. So uh, for this corner, I actually used, there's a bit of, let's see if the mouse, OK, there we go. You can see right here, there's a bit of um, tire mark in this white line. And that's what I use as a breaking point. As silly as it is and as hard as it is to see, that's all I've got here, because you don't have any other references. So I'm breaking at that point, And then my turn-in point is just slightly after that. And I've done enough laps now, I've practiced enough to know, you know, kind of instinctively, without thinking about it, where I want to turn in when I break at the same uh, speed. So there's the apex, you're looking at the apex. So this corner, uh, this corner is off camber, um, and you lose grip, especially coming out of it. So, you know, when you lose grip in the corner, you've got to really back the corner up and go slow into it. You've got to keep that in mind. I mean, you, you can't go through this corner but so fast. So that's an example of a blind corner, uh, blind apex. Another really good example of a blind apex, and I'm sure everyone's run this track, uh, Laguna Seca, Mazda Raceway Laguna Seca, sorry. Um, uh, turn six. So turn six, you've got, it's the hardest corner on the track. It's really hard. And it's equally as exciting in real life as you'd think it would be. Um, so turn six, you can't see the apex. You turn in, and it's really fast, so it's scary, because you have to be precise. Uh, you have to be accurate, and you have to be really quick with your inputs. Otherwise, you're going to be slow, because you've got that whole uphill exit coming out of it. So turn six at Laguna Seca. Let's think about this. Um, it's the fast left-hander. You've got that bridge. You've got the braking markers, which is good for reference, but you've got to have a turn-in reference or a point of turn-in in that type of corner as well, because you can't see the apex. So I usually brake. I think it's between the one and the two, and then I turn in immediately after, and I'm off the brake immediately after. It's just something where when you get it down, when you get that turn-in spot down, you want to repeat it lap after lap until you don't have to think about it, until it's in your subconscious. You just know what to do. You do that kind of stuff, and then you'll have more awareness for other things, like racing with other people um, and other distractions, basically. So, um, and people ask me or tell me, like, oh, I don't have a reference for a certain corner. I don't know where I'm turning in. I just do. Um, things like that. And I can tell you that you do want to have a reference for every single corner. It doesn't matter uh, what type of corner it is. If you're braking and you have to accelerate and you have to really think about the corner, it's not just a, a kink in the straightaway or something, you need to have a reference if you want to be consistent. Um, and the people that say, some, some people are fast and they'll say that they don't have references. Well, they do have references, but they're just not thinking about it. That's why they're fast. It's in their subconscious. Um, when you're, when you're going into, say, turn one here. Okay, so I'm already looking ahead. I'm already looking at the apex. Okay, so I'm going to start to give you guys like a visual of what I'm looking at for corner references. You know, this, this rig is really awesome, except there's one thing missing, and I need a notepad holder. But I guess that probably doesn't come with them very often. So. Okay, so you're looking at your apex. You're looking ahead. Right when, you're, right when you're at your apex, you should already be focused on getting off the corner. You want to get the throttle as soon as you can. And you want to bring the car all the way out to the outside edge of the track. If you're not using all the track, if you're not using every bit, bit of road, then you know that you can go faster and you can accelerate sooner. You know, bring the car out wide. You want to make as wide of a radius for every corner as you can, as wide of an arc. The wider your radius is, the more speed you're going to be able to carry through the corner. 
So anyway, back to the references before I get into that. Um, yes, references for every corner, every single corner. And like I said, if people say that they don't have references, they actually do, but they're just, it's so subconscious they're not even realizing it. Okay, so for instance, this is turn three at Donington. So I'm gonna walk you through my, my turn, my breaking, turn in, apex, and track out. So I've got a point where I'm gonna start to get on the brakes and I'm gonna turn in just soon after. Now, my breaking point's gonna be right at the beginning of this curb. So that's what I found to work best. That's giving me the best speed, entry, middle, and exit. Um, now when I break at this curb here, this is how ahead of the track I'm thinking. By the time I'm breaking at this curb, I've already started looking here to this apex. So I'm not even in the braking zone yet, but as soon as I get close enough to it, to where I can tell, okay, my car is on a path to go to this braking point right here, so I'm going to start to focus on this apex right here. Before I even start braking, that's how far ahead you need to be thinking if you really want to nail these reference points every lap, because things are happening really fast. And the faster the car is, the faster you got to keep up with where you're looking, your vision. Okay, so this turn here, so my braking reference, okay. So I'm already looking here, because this is where I want to place the car. And again, this has taken a lot of practice to figure out the line. But I know now that that's my reference. So right here, I want to get the car over to, and just past that point, I'm going to start braking. And before I even start braking, I'm already looking over here. Now this corner's tricky because it's a real kind of late apex. You want to turn in early, but you don't want to turn in too early and get to that inside curb too soon because your real apex is right about here. Right about here. And the way to figure out where the apex of the corner is, I know that's not easy, um, but the apex is always going to be the part of the corner where past that point you're accelerating and up to that point you're decelerating. So it's basically where the car is going slowest, center point of the corner. So you want to be accelerating past that point. And again, this one's blind. It's really hard. I, I mean, I've run a ton of laps here, and I'm still, I don't hit this perfectly every time. It's just hard. But now I do have a reference for turn in here. So again, this is a blind corner, like a turn six at uh, uh, Laguna. Um, I can't think of any other tracks, but there's tons of blind corners. Um, so it's a blind corner. So again, these types of blind corners where you can't see the apex, you can't see the center point of the corner, until you get to it, you know, be mindful of that turn in spot. Now what I use is I use this uh, board here at the top as like a turn in reference. So I know I've done it, again, I've done enough laps, it just takes practice. It's the only way you're gonna know this stuff. I've done enough laps to know that the apex is roughly around here. So if I turn in when this billboard just about passes the car, then I know I'll get to that curb right about where I want to be, so right about there. And this corner opens up real fast, so that's your apex, that point. You're going to get the throttle soon. It's your longest straightaway on the track, it's really important. Or one of the longest straightaways. Okay, so I think that's about it for the track. I'll just kind of walk you through the rest of my reference points here and show you how I do this stuff, figure it out. So going to the hairpin, completely different type of braking and turn in for these really slow speed corners. Um, you're able to brake straight here. You got plenty of time to brake in a straight line. So we're going to maximize the braking here, unlike the other fast corners where we start braking and turning right away. Now this corner, um, it's, it's really tough. And it's hard to find a reference because you don't have any um, corner markers, which is another reason why I wanted to use this track, because it's just all kinds of challenges. So there's some sort of dip in the curb right here. This is what I use as a braking reference. It's pretty hard to see. You can kind of see how the, there's like a crest in the curb right there. That's what I use as a braking point every single lap. Um, and I'll get into how to focus on that when there's other cars around you. I'll get into that later. But um, 
that's it. So I'm braking just before that, so I make sure if I carry the same amount of speed out of the chicane, and I know I brake at that same exact point right before, uh, right before that little bump in the curb, I know I'm going to get slowed down in just about the right amount of time. You got to be precise with your inputs, you got to be consistent with your inputs first before you can get to that point. But that's pretty much how I go about learning a track. Um, and when you're running different cars, the reference points are only going to change slightly. So having that fundamental understanding of the track is uh, it's important, and you can translate that to any other car as well. So before I move on, does anyone have like track-specific questions? How do you go about generally defining what your best apex is? And yeah, that's a really good question, and I could just go on about that for okay. so long. But I'll try to sum like summarize it. Um, basically, like, w w like you got to know the car. You got to know what the tire can do on turn in, under braking. So you want to turn in at that limit, but you want to stay within that limit of the tire. And so that's why it depends on the car. If I'm driving a formula car, my line is probably my turn in line might be a little bit quicker to the apex because I've got that downforce. I've got that extra bit of grip, so I can turn in faster. So that's going to define my apex, how quickly I can get to that central point that I've already mapped out with the track map uh, beforehand. How quickly can I get to that point? You know, how late can I break to get there? Um, and then basically, past that point, you know, that's where the corner starts to open up. So based around that, you can kind of figure in where the apex roughly is going to be. Um, and then you get into things like you know, the real technical corners where um, your exit needs to be compromised, like at like summit point, like that whole twisty section. You know, it's like, oh, what am I doing here? The car's sliding, but I got to turn left, but I can't because I'm, I'm sliding right. You know, and you got to back everything up and think ahead even more so in those types of corners. Um, but it's not easy to 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 do it. I mean, it's the, you know, there's a lot of visual involved, but it's about getting the best exit speed out of that from that point forward where the co corner opens up. Does anyone else have? Questions about learning the track? No. Just out of curiosity, watching professional drivers, a lot of times they'll have a track map in the middle of the road. Yeah, um, that's a good question. I don't really know why. <laughs> I, I think actually what it is is because um, I think when they go off track, they tell the they can tell like the the crew where they are, like what turn or something. So it's not like you know, oh, I don't know the track. I get it. Where am I? You know, while I'm driving at like full speed, which is what I thought originally. But yeah, so John John Kelly here. He's a he's a corner worker, former SCCA. Uh. Not just off track line. Also for like if a driver has an issue with a certain <coughs> curve, he, he doesn't know the curve number. He's coming back and tell the crew where the curve Oh yeah, right. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you're unfamiliar with the track, it's just kind of a good reference. Like, okay, that's six. Okay. So, anyone else got any questions? Yep. Oh, that's a great question, because I, I usually never use that. But in a corner like that last hairpin at Donington, it, it's an exception because you just have nothing else. You know, it's just all grass, and everything looks the same. So that's the only way. Right. Yeah. Yeah, Mazda's a really challenging track, uh, Mazda Raceway. And you got those medium speed bank corners where you get a turn in at the right time, the car sets in the banking, and then you kind of roll through it. Um, yeah, there, there, there's some sections of that track there where I'll use, like, right before I turn in, just a certain part of the curb, and I'll turn in right at it. You know, like that turn, uh, second to last corner of that fast right-hander. Kind of turn into it, and then the car hooks up and gets a lot of grip in the, in the camber. It's kind of like an oval corner. It's kind of banked at the apex, so. But uh, yeah, good question. Uh, anyone else got anything before I move on? We good? How many laps does it usually take you to get comfortable with the track? I mean, is it different for everybody or? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, learning a track, um, there's definitely like, I found a more systematic way of doing it and I try to do it as quickly as I can. Um, usually I'll just do laps like at moderately quick pace and I'll memorize the sections of track, like first sector, okay, I know this, second sector, okay, this is good. 
And then as I keep doing laps, I'll just, I, I always make mental notes when I'm doing laps, like in my mind, okay? Like next lap, I'm gonna try this here in this corner and see if this works. And then I'll just keep doing that until I've got all the corners down. And that'll usually take, mm, I don't know, 30 to 45 minutes maybe to where I start to like actually feel like I know where I'm going on the track. And then, you know, getting everything else out of the, the corners and knowing the little nuances is what takes longer, but just in general knowing the track within an hour for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're gonna go to um, talking about the car now. So that's kind of like a general way to learn tracks. Now, jumping in different cars is something that, uh, it's tricky for sure. Um, it, it takes a certain, uh, I guess, awareness to what the car is doing. You wanna understand the car in a certain way. So, before I get into that though, but um, a lot of people say smooth is fast, and it's like a really kind of general, almost like cliche term in driving now. People say that, oh, but I'm smooth, but I'm slow. So it's clearly smooth isn't fast, <laughs> you know. And I understand, I understand that, you know. It's, it's, uh, it's not, it's a, that's why it's a very general term, it doesn't help anyone. But, um, so smooth is fast. So what that really means is keeping the tire um, on the edge of traction all the way through a corner is fast and not going over that limit of traction. And from the outside it might look smooth, but um, that doesn't mean that your inputs need to be smooth to like go s make the car be look smooth on the track. For instance, um, and a lot of people have different driving styles in iRacing. Driving styles are fascinating. What people can do, different techniques to achieve the same lap time. But um, uh, so the driving style, and uh, let's see. Right, so really quick inputs. You're essentially doing the same thing. If your inputs are really quick, it doesn't mean that you're like throwing the car around and, and jerking it around. If people, anyone see me drive, I do a lot of lap videos, lap guides. My inputs are pretty quick, um, like braking and throttle and steering and whatnot. Not so much throttle and brake, but more so with my, the wheel. I make really quick light inputs, but I'm doing that to keep the car in a smooth arc through the corner. So that's what they mean by smooth is fast. Smoothly controlling the car on the limit so that you're not going over the tire's limit of traction because that is not fast. Um, so from the outside, it, it looks smooth. <clears throat> and that's your goal when, when you're driving. Your goal is always to drive right on the edge of the tire, find that limit of the tire and stay within those limits or be just at that limit, which obviously the closer you are to it, it gets harder. But uh, you wanna think about it, like how do I maintain uh, any given car's optimal grip level you know, under braking, uh, at apex and at exit? And the hardest part is how do you do that in that transition from braking to apex to track out? That's the hardest part about driving being able to do that, because it's all weight management, all, all managing weight transfer, and doing it smoothly. And, you, and again, you can do that smoothly with small, abrupt, quick inputs. Uh, again, from the outside, it might not look, or it, might, it will look smooth, but in the car, it might not look smooth. So the first thing I do when I'm getting in a new car, and like trying it out, I wanna, I wanna kind of find the limit of everything. I wanna find the limit of, Braking first, I'm gonna see how this car brakes. You know, does the car have ABS? Um, this one doesn't, so it's really easy to lock up. Oops. Okay, so you can see you can lock the brakes pretty easily. So let's see, let's go faster hard braking. And this is kind of, again, this is like what I'll do when I'm learning a car, I'll first play around with the brakes, I want to get a feel for the brakes. I need to find the limit of braking, so I want to memorize that point. And that's, again, where pressure sensitive pedals make driving way more fun because you're finding that limit of braking by feel. Uh, muscle memory is much easier than just by travel. Okay, so that was about 60-70% pressure. Um, and what I'm doing a lot of the time, I look at this a lot, because I need to know how much braking I'm using in a particular corner. Uh, that'll give me an idea of how much 
braking capability I can maintain, um, straight line braking, turn in uh, to apex. And that's really advanced stuff, so I won't get into it too much. But try the, um, you know, when you're learning a car, just get a feel for how quickly it stops. From a high speed, from a low speed, into a fast sweeper, into a hairpin. Because I, I, I see a lot of people um, tend to underbrake. And you know, when you're racing, you want to maximize everything. OK. And um, it's really important to, to always get to the limit of braking right away, because you're going to adjust your reference points based on, that, on uh, your braking. So you need it to be consistent. You need it to be consistently at the limit of, of pressure right from the start. So you're going to nail that brake pe pedal and get right up to that 70% like, as soon as you can right there. You know, and just start to practice when you're learning the track and you're driving the car, go into the corners and make sure you're maximizing your braking from the start. Makes it easier to find the limit and get to it. And it's another piece of the puzzle to getting consistent. You gotta be good on the, on the brakes. So acceleration, uh, different types of cars, you know, have more power or less grip, vice versa. So say this car, the Renault, this thing is kind of underpowered and it's got a lot of downforce. Makes for great racing. Uh, you don't have to worry too much about you know, spinning the tires and having to modulate the throttle so much. Maybe more like the GT3 or the GT1 where you do. Um, but you still have to be careful about modulating the throttle. And I'll show you here, it's particularly in the low speed in this type of car. High speed, this car has so much downforce. It, you know, you're not going to really ever spin this thing on exit unless your front downforce is way too high, front downforce percentage. So I'm going to go to the hairpin here and demonstrate. So once you get the braking down, you know, you move on to, to throttle modulation. You want to feel how the car reacts to increase in throttle. The smoother you can do that throttle increase, the more precise you can control it, the easier it's going to be to control the car. So it's really important to practice that. So here we go into the first hairpin. So I mean, I can get, I can get this thing pretty loose in first, then the second corner gets really loose. OK, so obviously too much throttle. Um, I was steering the wheel too much past the apex, too much throttle. So when you think about that and you think about what happened, um, OK, you do need to be mindful of how much throttle you're using. You can't just mash the gas. Because um, you're asking too much out of the tire. You know, you're trying to accelerate. You're trying to create those acceleration Gs that kick you back in the seat. And you're also you know, continuing to turn. So you can't do both at the same time. The tire can only, can only get so much uh, traction out of the tire, especially on braking and turning. That's, again, that's the hardest part of, of driving. So with a little bit more throttle modulation, um, what we call maintenance throttle, it really will save you. you know, especially when you're learning a track and you're learning the car, you don't want to be mashing the gas too hard. You want to be real smooth with the throttle. The difference between 100% throttle and 70% is massive in just keeping the car stable. Because when you, when you accelerate, you're getting that weight transfer to the rear end, so you're actually getting more traction in the rear. But now you accelerate too much, and then now you're going to start to overload the rear tires because they're going to want to spin. So you got to find that middle ground. Be real smooth with the throttle. You don't want to get to throttle too soon. We get to throttle just past the apex. We've already mapped out our apex because we studied the track. We did a bunch of laps. But we're going to wait until we get to the apex and see what happens here. So there's the apex. OK, now partial throttle, partial throttle, real tight. That was good because the corner, uh, last lap, I got to throttle too soon and I still had to keep turning. So because I was turning and then I got in throttle, car wanted to just continue to turn to the left. So keep in mind, you know, the type of corner, if it's a hairpin, really slow type, uh, tight corner, you just got to be more patient with throttle. There's no other way around it. 
and uh, that's where it's really important to modulate the throttle. Okay, so, and then steering. Um, you, wanna, you wanna start to connect your steering inputs with your throttle and brake inputs. Again, just more stuff to think about. I know it's a lot. But um, you, wanna, you wanna be able to use a throttle to help steer the car. You wanna steer with the wheels as little as you can. Again, it's just gonna make it smoother. It's gonna make it easier to drive. So when I make those quick steering inputs that I mentioned, they're real light inputs. And it's kind of, those steering inputs that I make are used more so to help guide the car whereas my brake and throttle inputs are almost used more so to help steer the car in faster corners in particular. Slow corners, okay, you're using the wheel to steer the, steer the car more. But these fast turns, it's all about your braking and turning. All you're using that steering wheel for is to aid the car in weight transfer. And that brake and throttle is your tool to get that get the most speed out of the car possible through the corner. So easy in the throttle. That was sloppy. So real light on the brake, real smooth. I'm not using any more than 90 degrees of steering input. It's real important. You don't want to crank the wheel too hard. You don't want to overwork those front tires. You're already asking a lot out of them if you're starting to accelerate. When you start to accelerate, if you want to have better traction for accelerating, then start bringing the wheel back to neutral sooner. Because that acceleration is going to give you more oversteer, and if you're still turning, you're going to get that, you're going to get a snap oversteer before you know what happened. So start thinking about how you can be smoother with the steering. Use less steering. It's the most important thing is less steering, less wheel input. Don't rely on just cranking the wheel to get the car to turn. <clears throat> if you're doing that, you're overdriving. <coughs> Excuse me, you're overdriving the front tire. Real smooth inputs, okay. Uh, and shifting is real important, of course, but the timing of your downshifts is, is important too. And how do you select the gear that you wanna use? Um, that'll come down to the type of corner you're going to, how much speed you could potentially carry through the corner. A lot of people tend to use a gear lower than they should, thinking that's gonna give you better acceleration off the corner. But say, for instance, like in the turn one here, <laughs> reset real quick. Um, going into turn one, say we're going to try to use second gear uh, through the corner instead of third. So when you're using second gear, that's going to limit you to a certain amount of speed. It might feel faster. You might feel like, oh, yeah, I'm spinning the tires. You know, you're going real fast, but you're not carrying the momentum. That's the important thing. Um, so you want to be able to use the highest gear you can that isn't bogging the car down. It's all about keeping those torque levels up. So second gear here might feel good, but you're going to overslow because you can't go any faster. If you're in second gear, you're already limited to, let's see how fast this goes. Second. So 75 mile an hour. In that corner, you can take a little bit faster than 75. So you know, be mindful of that, and, and, and you want to shift as less as possible, too. So just you want it to be real smooth and real flowing. You don't want to you don't want to slow the car down, you want to overslow it too much. Fourth gear there. We're just thinking about upshifts for now. Fourth gear. See, the revs are kind of low, but I wasn't going fast, but when I'm really on it, fourth gear is um, much better. You can get better torque. And, and the car, it makes the car more stable. So using the higher gear gives you more stability. You more, uh, you know, more traction. That's most important, and you're able to go faster. I never use first gear in this car, um, and I try not to use second, only in hairpins. But actually, this track, uh, I have been using first just to get it turned in. This is a real awkward turn, but usually you will never have to use first gear. So I go down to fourth to kind of get a last little bit of turn in, and then immediately short shift to second which isn't ideal, but you can't adjust the gears in this car, so you have to, <clears throat> excuse me, you have to compromise sometime. Another way to, to be able to tell if you are in too low of a gear, say if you're in second gear when you should be in third, is 
once you get to throttle, how soon, like to the track out point, do you have to upshift? If you have to upshift and you're still turning, you're into low of the gear. You know, you want to be rolling out of the corner and, and just maintain in that torque, in that higher gear, you'd be going faster. So if we're in second gear here, I'm going to have to upshift to third right about here, and I'm still turning. So keep that in mind. You don't want to, you don't want to be upshifting at the corner exit. You know, you don't want to upshift until you can really sort of neutralize the car, sort of straighten it out. Otherwise, you're, you're going to kill your exit speed because you're turning and upshifting, and it's going to unsettle the car, and you can't go as fast. Now, downshifts, um, I know a lot of people have problems with this car because it um, limits your, your revs on downshifts, so you can't just bang down the gears. Um, it's okay. You got, it, it takes some getting used to. You just got to space out your downshift. You want to get the braking done first before you start downshifting. It's real important. Any car you're in, you want to do that. You don't want to ever downshift like right when you're braking because you're going to blow the engine. If it's like the Skippy or the, the Mazda, you're going <clears> to <throat> eventually end up blowing the engine. So my downshifts are always nice and, and evenly paced, controlled. So braking, OK, downshift. And I try to get the downshift done before I'm getting off the brake. Because when I get off the brake, that gives me an extra bit of turn in. And the downshift is going to slightly unsettle the car if you're turning. So that's why you want to try to get that downshift done before you really start to commit to your turn in. So committing to the apex right here. So we want to get the downshift done in that braking phase before apex. But not too soon. You don't want to do it before you even start braking. So there's a middle ground there, and you've got to find that sweet spot. The most important thing is to space out your downshifts. OK. That's just the basics of, of learning a car and the things to think about. So the braking, you know, maximize the braking when you're learning a car. Um, see what it can do. And I, and I forgot to talk about ABS. So the GC3 cars have ABS. How do you find the limit of braking in a car that never locks wheels? Well, and this is where the actually using MoTeC is good because you can see the look at the longitudinal Gs, and um, you can see sometimes you, you'll use 80% pressure, and um, you actually get more weight transfer, more, more longitudinal Gs with 80% than you do in 100% with ABS, um, and that's so that's how you find like where the ABS is working most efficiently. And um, another thing you can do, I mean, you can feel it on track, but it's harder with ABS because, again, you don't have that you know, lock up, locking up cue to know when you're going over the limit. But um, also, you don't want to really use full-on ABS in the GT3s because I'm pretty sure it overheats the tires. Um, so you want to try to find that sweet spot to where you're braking and the car is stopping just as well as it does at 100, but you're using less than 100. So I, like in the GT3s, usually I'll brake at 90 or so. Um, we raced the, that World Championship GT3 at Monza last week in the BMW, and we, we usually use really high ABS because um, we found it works really good. So with the GT3 ABS going into the really tight uh, hairpins, you can, uh, you can pretty much get to about 90, 95, 100 is fine too occasionally. It's hard to modulate it perfectly, but you don't need to be braking at max pressure. Even with full ABS, is, is my point. Are we good on time? OK. Um, yeah, yeah, no, I, yeah. No, there's, there's some other stuff here. So um, OK, right, so questions regarding the car. Yeah, we'll do that. All right, so for, for Q&A, you guys have a question, raise your hand. We'll get you the mic. And uh, we'll go ahead and do it that way. So let's start over here. Hold on. Hey, Wyatt. Hey. Um, I wanted to ask you specific, specifically about uh, downshifting um, and whether your particular style or which one you think is better, if it's, you know, just smooth and steady all the way down as soon as you start braking or, you know, some guys compress the downshifting uh, down towards the end of the braking zone. Both end the downshifting, tech, but, you know, it's like more hard on the brakes first and then, you know, when you're midway down the revs, downshifting there, it's like... I found that technique is dependent on the car as well, which one you have to employ. Yeah. Yeah, it does depend on the car. Like the GT3s and the Renault and all these new cars with all the aids. Um, 
you just got to get used to like pacing your downshifts because you can only do them so fast. Um, in the Star Mazda, and people have a different way of doing it because it's like you're trying to get a lot done in a short amount of time. So whatever works for you, where you can get it done before you start to get off the brake and turn in, then you know it should be okay. For instance, in um, the Star Mazda, when I'm braking, and I'll do this in a lot of cars that don't have the assist where you can downshift freely, I always get on the brake and let the car, I let that weight set on the front, you know, that weight transfer on the braking happen before I even start downshifting. You always want to do that. You don't want to do it so soon um, while that weight transfer is still happening. Once the car's set, you know, you're braking, feel that weight transfer to the front, now you can downshift and just focus on the rest, which is the turn in point, the apex, all that stuff. But with um, Star Mazda, for instance, sometimes I'll go, I'll go six, five, four, three, two. You know, so I'm spacing it, but I'm, I'm doing like real quick, you know, but I only get maybe a couple of downshifts done and then let the car settle a little bit more and then two more and then turn in. But as long, you, so you can do it different ways in different cars, um, completely different, like you said, in different cars. But uh, yeah, as long as you're getting the downshift done before you turning into the apex, you know, because you're braking, downshifting, turning into the apex. So, good question though. Uh, hey, Wyatt, I had a question about the uh, on-screen brake pressure indicator, because I've heard you and some other quick guys talk about looking at that while you're driving. Mm -hmm. But how does that translate? What would you do in a real car? Because so, obviously you don't have that display. Yeah, well, that's why sim racing is cool, because we can cheat with all this <laughs> sweet stuff. We got, we got data overload in sim racing. So. But it's great for real coaching, because you can figure stuff out even faster. But um, that's a really good question. Uh, in the real car, you just, I mean, we have data for brake pressure, but you can't see it like, as you're driving. And in a real car, you can feel the G's so much better. I mean, obviously. Um, and, and so you're going by feel more of the G's, the braking G's. And uh, you can tell when you're braking at the limit just by feel. OK, that felt good. OK, that felt slow, you know, just by the way you're getting pushed forward. OK, that's the limit. So a little bit different in how you can feel you know, some stuff in the, in the real car. So with this uh, threshold braking, it's okay to have the ABS activated, but because we're there's been a lot of discussion about this. Do we want the ABS to be activated? You're saying just a little bit, so you're saying 90% in GT3. Yeah. Because um, I noticed with the new Mazda, it really doesn't like 100% brakes. <laughs> oh, the Mazda, the new one's so much different than the old car. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, the new one, and it, it's different by car. You know, you just got to feel it out by the car, and you know, there's no set way that it is for every car, but, but no, that's a good point. The GT3s, you can use more brake than the Mazda for sure, what I've noticed too. I, I really like that new car, by the way, so much better than the old one. Does anyone else have questions? How does the whole coaching thing work? Do you like, do we like record a race and you watch us and coaches and what we did? Is it one-on-one? -on -one? Is, there, is there different blocks that you do? Or, or how does that whole thing work? How do you, yeah. how, how do you coach people um, online? It's like really, I guess it's really personalized. That's why I would just um, talk to people and we'll arrange something based on your needs, your goals, what you're racing, what you're doing. Um, but it's, it's always one-on-one -on -one and I'll usually be in a session with you. So it's like, uh, we'll go on TeamSpeak and uh, get in a session together. I'll watch you drive for a bit. Um, and before we even get out on track, I usually have you send me a replay. So just to kind of get an idea of what you're doing, send your replay setup, um, and that prepares me better for the session. So then we kind of know, you know what to focus on. And, um, and like I was saying before, I mean, everyone learns differently. You know, everyone is at a different level of skill. Um, that's why when I do coach people privately, it's like we need to figure out you know, where we're at, what we're working with, and where we want to go, and then set up a plan around that. Um, just email or email or call, mm -hmm. and it's on my website too. Just email, but I it's usually just get messages through email. Um, my cell number it's on the note note card or the note paper too, but yeah, it's usually how I do it. Well, a follow up to that last thing was you get a lot faster with Wyatt than you will with a new shifter. <laughs> It's a, it's a good way to look at it. Um, I have, 
I, I, as you know, I'm sort of a one-trick pony, and <clears throat> I, I race spec racers. I've been playing a little bit with GT3s, and am really frustrated at trying to get any of these cars around a hairpin. Yeah. Okay, good. It's That's just, all I wanted to know. It's such a whole... <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the low-speed grip is just a whole different deal. You, you have to be so much more careful with throttle modulation in the GT3. Um, I expect to be able to, to do something to get it to snap around a hairpin at, say, Montreal. <clears throat> and I can't. Mm -mm. I just slow the thing to a walking pace. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's the way it is. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. It's, you get those cars turned on the brakes a lot rather than, like, acceleration. Well, the, the front engine cars, anyway. I think it was last year I was watching one of your seminars or one of your lectures here, mm -hmm. and in the GT3 cars you were saying that you run your ABS on 10, and I was wondering if is there is it always just best to run it maxed out or is there any advantage or is it car handle like will mm. it behave differently under the brakes if you turn that down a little bit or is there any speed to be gained by doing that? I think at this point it's just what I'm used to, and I, I just like it because I know the ABS works really well. A lot of people run lower ABS though, so, you know. It's just I think it's just preference. Because I like the car to feel, um, it's like to me it's the same thing as running low ABS, but I don't even have to worry about locking up. I feel like I can just sense weight transfer better with more ABS. One of those things that I probably can't even explain to you why, it just feels better basically. Uh, Wyatt, uh, question, uh, do you find that most people are driving way too deep into the corners is one of the biggest problems, especially into the uh, formula cars and stuff? Yeah, yeah, definitely in the formula. but. Um, in general, I think people tend to try to make up time in the wrong places. You know, they're not focusing on getting off the corner, keeping momentum up. They're focusing on, okay, I'm not fast. Uh, this guy's braking later than me. I need to brake later. But that, that's only the start of changing everything you're doing throughout the whole corner and thinking about everything differently. Um, yeah, in the formula cars, you can't really brake too late and expect the car to turn. And, well, the Renault, which is great because that's how it is in real life, too. It's a you know, rear engine, underpowered car. I mean, you can't get that thing to whip around a hairpin. I don't care what you do to it. Um, so you really got to back up the corner and focus on carrying the speed from braking point to apex and maximizing that tire's traction from braking to apex. Not so much where you're braking, it's how you're getting off the brakes. That's important. The, the ABS in, in, in GT3 cars is really bizarre. It's, a, it, it's not intuitive at all. And, it, and the same thing is true in, in, in real cars as well. In, at uh, Petit Le Mans two years ago, uh, GT1 Aston Martin coming in to turn 10 knocked the power off to the car with his knee coming in to turn 10, which, big deal, ah, knocked the ABS off. So he is absolutely from the top of the hill down, totally front wheels locked all the way into the gravel trap upside down. So you would think that your balance on the brakes would be pretty close whether the ABS is on or not. Well, that's not true in iRacing and it's not true in, in real GT3 cars because obviously that was, the, the balance was set way, way, way too far to the front and he was using the ABS to correct for that. So. Uh, I, I think everybody struggles with this, and it's just a feel and, and what works when you get down to it. Because if you try to figure it out, you just screw yourself into the ground. You, you, know, you come out, you don't, you don't know anything more than when you start it. Yeah, yeah, it's good to just stick with something that works, and not venture too far from that. Like I, I mean, since the G three cars have been have came out, I've pretty much been running uh, like forty nine fifty brake bias with the ABS at ten. Um, and different cars would be a little bit different, but I'm pretty much exclusively in the BMW. But I do a lot of work in the Audi and the Merc, and uh, I hate the McLaren. Sorry, McLaren guys, but I just I hate that car. If you turn the ABS off with that brake bias, almost a problem. Yeah, and when you lower the ABS, your brake bias is going to need to change. Yeah. Um, more ABS, you can go more rearward with the brake bias, actually. But So if you do want to try, like if you're trying high ABS and you want to try low, low ABS, then keep in mind you're going to have to adjust your brake bias to get the same feel. More questions? 
you have a track that you find is best to learn a new car on that ha has a good uh, mix of corners and, and that, that yeah. you can just baseline learn it? Um, I, I think it's just important to go to a track that you know, like first and foremost. I mean, there's a lot of different tracks with um, a good mix of low speed, high speed, threshold, sweeping stuff. Um, I think my go-to test track is probably Zandvoort. I just really like it. I like the flow of it. Um, but yeah, I mean, most any track would be fine. Like, uh, Road Atlanta is a really good test track. Yeah, don't do Donington, because you'll, you'll probably not like the new car that you're trying if you're trying it on Donington. Because <laughs> it's like the horrible off-camber uh, hairpin just makes the cars feel kind of strange. <laughs> But um, yeah, Road Atlanta is like my test track too. Road Atlanta is Anvort. Road Atlanta, you, you can really test how the car is going to be over bumps. Um, same with Sebring. I like Sebring for testing too. And you got the sweeping fast stuff and you got the, the hairpin and the chicane. So. Anybody else? Questions? Why are you uh, ready yeah, to wrap it up? Yeah, we're about wrapped up. Okay. All right, well, why don't we give Wyatt Gooden a uh, round of applause here. Thanks.